All right. Uh, we are in uh, studying the Word of God this morning in the Bible and its aspects, life-changing power to us. So um, A.W. Tozer, some of you may remember him as this author, he writes and he says, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. Now, isn't that good? He's looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. But he goes on to say, what a pity that we only plan the things that we can do ourselves. <laughs> Isn't it true? We often leave God out of the impossible. We just look at what we can do. So that's where the Bible kind of comes in, and it, it confronts the ordinary in our life to become the extraordinary. Um, but as we watched in our little video, a lot of people are confused about what the Bible says. So I thought this was kind of interesting. A bunch of middle school students were polled as to what they thought the Bible said. Now, some of these you've heard before, but some of them maybe you haven't. So they asked these middle school students what the Bible talked about, and this is what the kids said. Number one, Noah's wife was Joan of Arc. <laughs> okay? Number two, Moses went to the top of Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. That was not as funny, I guess. Number three, the seventh command is, thou shalt not admit adultery. <laughs> Number four, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. <laughs> Number five, the followers of Jesus were called the 12 decibels. Number six, David killed Galahad, who was one of the Finkelsteins. I don't know where they got that one, but we need to talk to the Sunday school teacher. And this one I like, but I'm going to get in big trouble because number seven is this. A Christian should have only one wife, and that is called monotony. Monotony. <laughs> Sorry. Depends on the wife. Well, that's true. It could be pretty exciting. <laughs> so we are going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you want to dive in there with me, as we uh, pick up with that, with those misunderstandings about the Bible, that we want to see what the Bible can speak to us, because it is the Word of God. And as we read in our verse this morning, it is living and active, and it, it judges us, and it speaks to us. And if we allow it, it changes us like no other thing in the world. The Apostle Paul preached in the city of Thessalonica for only about three weeks before he was run out of town. So not a very popular guy during that time. I mean, go up, share the word of God, and what do they do? They run you out of town within three weeks. But because of that, because of his preaching, there was a small church that was formed, and Paul writes to them after he has left the city, um, and speaking to them and facing the opposition that they're up front and talking to them about what they have done. So he writes to them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 16, he says this, And we also thank God continually, because when you receive the word of God, so what did they do? They did what with the word of God? They received it. Which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the Word of God. Now, right there, you can kind of see where we're going. The Word of God is spoken. And this group of people received it, not as a good book, not as some nice moral thing, not even as mythology, but literally as the Word of God. And that's what changed it. He goes on to say, which this Word of God is at work in you who believe. So one is acceptance for what it is and what it states of itself. Second is, we have to believe that completely. Then Paul goes on, he writes, For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen the same things those other churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit, and the wrath of God has come to them at last. So what we see in this small section of scripture that Paul preached for three short weeks in the city in Thessalonica, but there were a remnant of those that accepted the word of God, but there were a lot more that did what? rejected it. It didn't fit their Gentile, their Jewish, their Roman, their Greek society, and they didn't receive it for what it was. Well, isn't that true of today? The Word of God goes out, and like we read in our parable in Luke, there are a few that accept it and believe it for what it is, and God moves in their lives and changes them to produce much. But in that parable, there are like 75%, three-fourths, 
that hear it and really don't do much with it and go away unchanged. And I don't know if you've ever seen someone that's come to the Lord in salvation, heard the word of God, come to Jesus in salvation, and then got disgruntled again by the worries of the world or whatever was going on. They are so apathetic towards Christianity, they don't want to have anything to do with it, right? The call this morning <coughs> is to let the word of God speak to us. Now, with that in mind, there was a, a journalist from New York a number of years ago, A.J. Jacobs, who what he would do, he would write these books as a journalist, but he would go about and do something radical for a short amount of time, and then he would write about it. For example, one year he spent the entire year reading every single volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now that's a life worth living, right? Isn't that exciting? <laughs> but in 2007, he wrote a book entitled the Year of Living Biblically, One Man's Humble Quest to Follow the Bible as Literally as Possible. Now in this, he found this obscure rule in Leviticus 19 about Jewish men not cutting the corners of his beard. Well, Jacob wasn't sure what the corners of his beard was, so he just didn't shave at all. Now you've got to understand, Jacob's, a -W, or, yeah, A.J. Jacobs was not a Christian. In fact, his family was Jewish and he claims to be completely agnostic. But for his project, he thought it would make for a good book, so he bought a Bible and he read it in four weeks and he kept notes of every single rule that he could find in the Bible to try and follow. Well, he came up with about 700 rules. And uh, the vast majority of those rules, of course, we know from the Old Testament were kosher rules and rules about the Jewish society. So, Mr. Jacobs, stopped wearing clothes of mixed fabric because that was one of the rules in the Old Testament. He played a ten-stringed harp and he blew, a, he blew a shofar or a ram's horn at the first of every month because in the Old Testament it said to do that. He refused to shake hands with women because they might be ceremonially unclean. I'm sure that made a lot of women happy. And he did all these rules to try and show what it would be to live the Bible literally by the rules. One time as he was finishing up writing the, the rules in this book, he came across a man in Central Park, and of course he probably stood out because of what he was doing, and he'd been living this way for months, and the man asked him what he was doing. So when Mr. Jacobs explained to him, the man said, well, is there any rule that you found in the Bible that you haven't done yet? And he says, well, actually, yes, there is one. And he pulled out some pebbles out of his, his jacket, and he said, there's a rule that it says you have to stone someone who's committed adultery. So the guy said, well, this is kind of odd, but I've committed adultery. And so Mr. Jacobs went to throw those little pebbles at him, but before he could do that, the guy grabbed the stones out of his hand, threw them back, and said, an eye for an eye. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jacobs' book, I guess, was quite funny. I haven't read it. And he accomplished his goal over the course of a year. But he said that reading the Bible didn't cause him to believe in God, but it did change him as an agnostic to what he now calls himself as a reverent agnostic, which in my mind is no different. He reported that he found something very powerful when he read the Bible. For instance, he was a workaholic working constantly, but because of the rules in the Bible not to work on the Sabbath, this was the first time in his life that he took actually a day off. And he reported that his stress level was amazingly reduced. Of course, as we look back at this, we see that his experiment and his book were both a failure. Why? Because Mr. Jacobs saw the Bible as a book of rules, a book of things you had to do, which if you look in most religions, isn't that really what they are? You have to do the rules. You have to do things right. What Mr. Jacobs didn't realize is that the Bible is actually a love letter from God to us. A letter to us explaining how God would have us live different than how we do live. A letter introducing us to God instead of about God. A letter that speaks to our heart, and if we allow it to move, it changes us to the point that we do things because we want to, not because we what? Have to. And isn't that even sadly where most Christians spend their lives as they come to church and they think they have to do these rules and keep these things straight to be good for God? But that's not what God says. Because if that were true, why would there be grace and forgiveness? Why would there be love that covers a multitude of sins? 
Well, the Bible speaks to it. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says this. It says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they're actually foolishness to him. In other words, if we don't have salvation and the Holy Spirit to understand that this Bible is a love letter to us, not a bunch of do's and don'ts and rules that we have to do, then we're going to completely miss the point, even in church, aren't we? I mean, we're going to be thinking, well, I have to do this better so God will accept me. I have to do this more, and I, well, I messed that up, so God's probably mad at me. And that's not the case. Our nation, as you can well tell if you watch any of the news, is losing its moral compass, isn't it? I mean, we are on a tailspin. Our leaders, most of them, no longer deem the Bible reliable or important. In fact, in 2005, some 15 years ago, the state Supreme Court of Colorado overturned a death penalty that convicted a murderer because the jurors consulted a Bible in their, in their, in their judgment. And the state Supreme, Supreme Court said the Bible constituted an improper outside influence on the case. Daniel Webster, that American statesman, once said this, If we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering. But if we and our prosperity neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury all of our glory in profound obscurity. And I think we're seeing a lot of that today that although our money states one nation under God, we're really one nation under all the idols of God's being ourselves and our money and our fame, that we have walked away from God. He is no longer the authority and neither is the Bible. So this morning we want to look at the Bible, two aspects of the Bible, and how it speaks to us and changes us, and then follow up with the remainder next week. So number one is this. The Word of God, the Bible, comes through ordinary people. Now here's the funny, crazy thing about God. Don't you think if God was going to give us a Bible, he would take the most honored scholars and literary giants to give us the Word of God? Wouldn't that make sense? I mean, we would instantly have some respect for that, wouldn't we? But God doesn't work that way. God takes ordinary men and speaks in and through them to speak to us, which actually should give us some comfort because most of us in here don't take this wrong, are pretty what? Ordinary. Ordinary. And what this means, what this speaks to me, is it gives me hope that even in my ordinariness, my plainness of life, my lack of fame, my lack of stature and power, that God can use me and God can use you in immense ways. Right? Isn't that really the message? First Thessalonians said this as Paul was speaking to that Thessalonican church. He said, you accepted the word of God not as the word of men, but actually as it was the word of God. You see, Paul had the audacity to tell this church the truth of what they had done. He said, although you know the scriptures that you have, which at that time were pretty limited, they weren't the full Bible that we have today, but the scriptures they had at that time was the mouth of God speaking through ordinary men to God's people to draw them closer to him. What makes the Bible totally unique is this, a little history lesson that we've looked at in the past, that the Bible was written over 1,500 years by 40 different people in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And they were ordinary people who were, in, who were inspired by an extraordinary God. In fact, first, or 2 Peter 1-2 goes on to say this as Peter writes. He says, The prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they carried along, were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So what that means is this. Bible, 1,500 years in writing, 40 different authors, three different languages, and actually several different continents. If we tried to duplicate it, let's just say we go to West Valley, because West Valley is a fun kind of place, right? 
Let's say we went to the West Valley, we picked 40 individuals that lived in the same neighborhood, gave them a subject and said, hey, will you write about this subject? How many of those things do you think would completely match up? Not many, would they? That's what makes the Word of God amazing from the very beginning. That all of these authors, different continents, different languages, different generations, different time periods, some of them not even aware of each other, were moved by God as ordinary individuals, wrote this down as God spoke in and through them to us. And they're all about the central message of Jesus Christ and the need for salvation in Him. God's desire to change us into who He originally created us to be and to empower us with the Holy Spirit. You see, the Bible says, the Lord says some 2,600 times. As these men are speaking, they're not saying, hey, I got this great idea, or thus saith John. It says, the Lord says. In other words, the authors had the humility to step back and say, hey, these aren't my words. And by the way, they weren't shucking out a responsibility like, hey, it's not my fault. They were saying, this is what God is saying to us. The Lord says, capital L, big L. The Bible is unique in that fact. And again, comes through ordinary people. Now, in contrast, let's look at two other religions in our world and how their major writings came about. Anybody in this room ever hear the Book of Mormon? Maybe once, maybe twice. Well, how did the Book of Mormon come about? Well, one man, as you know, Joseph Smith, claimed that an angel Moroni gave him some golden plates inscribed in Egyptian hieroglyphics. But it's interesting how Joseph Smith translated these golden um, tablets that supposedly went back with the angel. He took them in a room. He had a curtain up between him and another man that was writing down what Joseph Smith said. And Joseph Smith would take his seer stone, which at that time in history in the 1800s, a lot of the, the psychics would use these stones to try and tell the future or to find buried treasure. So he would take this seer stone and he would place it in his hat and then he supposedly put his face down in his hat and the stone spoke to him about what was to be said as another guy on the other side of the curtain transcribed and wrote it down. Well, I don't know, not making fun, but I think it's kind of funny that amazingly, a lot of what Joseph Smith had write down, the message he received from that seer stone was the new or was the old King James version of the Bible. Isn't it amazing how almost all of it mimics up, but then he would add in his own twist and his own interpretation for the time, which of course, as we look back in history, have been proved what? Incorrect. Incorrect. And as you look at the history of the Mormon church has been changed again and again and again to meet the times, the social dynamics and the politics and the culture of the time. Whereas the word of God has stayed solid, unwavering, unchanging, consistent. Just as God says he is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow. He also says that there is no section of scripture that will be wiped out or replaced until he comes back to fulfill it. The Word of God, the Bible that was written some 2,000 years ago, even with different translations, remains the same. Well, what about the Quran? Beginning in 610 AD, Muhammad was in a cave and he says the angel Gabriel appeared to him and dictated to him what was to write. Now you've got to remember, what does the Bible say about some angels? That demons appear as angels of light? They're sneaky little buggers. They take on this appearance that's not true. So they need to be tested in order to be accurate. So supposedly as the angel Gabriel spoke to Muhammad, he wrote down a series of things that uh, until his death that was supposed to happen to make up the Quran. For instance, supposedly this angel told him that he had to stop facing Jerusalem when he prayed and face Mecca. He also wrote that if you're going to read the Quran, it could only be read <coughs> in Arabic. So if you want to read the Quran, what do you have to learn? Arabic. It's a singular language. You have to learn that. In contrast, God spoke through all different kinds of ordinary people as we've talked about, right? 1,500 years, 40 people, three languages, 
multiple continents, right? He spoke through Moses, who was a prince of Egypt that was running out in the wilderness. He spoke through Daniel, who was a prime minister um, riding in a place we call Iraq. He spoke through Paul, who most of the time when he spoke through Paul was where? Remember? In prison, shackled to a Roman guard. That was the only time God slowed Paul down enough to actually write the letters of the New Testament that we have. He spoke through Amos, who was just simply a farmer. He spoke through Peter, who all, all of us know what did Peter do for a living? Fisherman. Fisherman. He spoke through Solomon, who was a wise king. He spoke through Luke, who was a doctor. And he spoke to, the, to Matthew, who in our modern day language would be considered an IRS guy, right? God spoke through all these people, not just a singular language, not through a stone, but he uttered his messages to them. He spoke in a thundering message to Moses. To Jeremiah, to Jeremiah, it says that the word of God was like fire in his bones. I mean, they just moved and he had to get these out. To Elijah, he spoke in a still, small voice. God spoke to Daniel through dreams and visions. What the message is, is this. The Bible, the Word of God, is for all people. It's for all people. You don't have to speak a certain language to have the Bible. God spoke His Bible that all would understand. If you want to look at a doctor's <coughs> point of view, you can look from the Gospel of Luke. If you want to look from a fisherman's point of view, you read what Peter wrote. If you want to read what a king would say, you read the things of Solomon. But God speaks to all of us saying that this is for you and it's for all people. Lower class, middle class, upper class, man, woman, young, old, irrelevant of culture and nationality. The word of God is for all people. That's really what the message is, isn't it? It's for all people. Well, and thank goodness the Bible has lasted through all these things. In fact, it's been translated into some 700 languages so far. Full, New Testament, Old Testament, 700 languages. Um, the New Testament alone has been translated into 1,548 languages as of last week. And there are currently, with Wycliffe Ministries, 2,617 languages that they're working on to translate the Bible. But that still leaves about 1.5 people, one in every five, that are waiting to hear the Word of God in their own language. The fun thing is for us, we've been through Michelle Peterson involved in two of those translations. I don't remember the second one, but the first one was the Jula translation in the New Testament. Again, the fact is what God is saying is the Bible is for everyone because God wants all to hear his message and to accept it for what it is, as the word of God. Even to test it, to see if it is true and real. For example, in Micah, God says, test me in this talking about giving back the Lord, test me by you giving and trust me, and will not the, head, the floodgates be open to you? God says, check the word of God. It is true, and it's all for all of you. So 40 men, different times, different cultures, different languages. But the Bible has that common theme. The focus is on Jesus Christ as the Son, the Savior of God, who came to forgive the sins of our lives and bring us salvation and change us and fill us with the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible is about. The Bible is not just a good book. It's God's book, right? It's not just a good book. It's God's book. And as we realize this, if we, like the people in Thessalonica and that church, realize that the Bible truly is the mouth, the voice, the message of God, shouldn't we pay attention to it? Shouldn't we seek that out? I mean, as I'm writing this, I was thinking, how ironic. We spend billions of dollars every year looking for aliens. <laughs> right? We've got those big satellites up. They're sending out messages. We send satellites and probes in the sky. Billions of dollars reaching out to aliens that we hope will speak back to us, right? We spend billions of dollars trying to get to Mars, right? Because, well, that's maybe the next place that we can inhabit and live and looking for life on Mars. We spend billions of dollars trying to understand the cosmos. All the documentaries are on the History Channel and PBS, right? Billions of dollars. 
And yet God gives us his message in the Bible. Where we are spending all this money and effort and time trying to find God out there. God says, I'm right here. I'm right here. If you just open my love letter to you, accept it for what it is and read it. And come to know salvation in my son Jesus. Isn't that ironic? It's human nature that we want God on our terms, isn't it? So we seek and we look every place but the obvious. You know, I think about that. It's probably what I'm going to be. Well, I'm already kind of there now, but probably in a couple of years where I'm walking around the house going, honey, have you seen my glasses? And where are they? Right on my head, right? You know that old joke? We have to look in the obvious that God speaks through us in the word of God. And that's so powerful when we think of it. But we get so distracted by all these other things that the Bible sits on a shelf and collects dust. And yet there, the power of God, the voice of God, is right there to speak to us, to change us, to lead us into God's perspective and to see his view. And it's there. In fact, most of us have several Bibles in our home, and they lay there. What an irony. Second thing we want to talk about the Word of God is that is this, that when we do take it and we do accept it for what it is, God works in us through the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 said, The Word of God, which is at work in you who believe. The Word of God is at work in you, personal, who do what? Who believe. So the question is, before we go any further, is do you believe the Word of God? I mean, you've got to get through that hurdle before you go on to anything else, right? Do you believe the Word of God is truly the voice of God speaking to us? To those who accept it for what it is, God says he goes to work in our life. We are under construction to draw us into spiritual maturity. I don't know about you, but when I'm thirsty, I can drink a glass of water and I start to feel relieved. Anybody else in here do that? Maybe it's a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi, I don't know. But, you know, I'm thirsty, I could drink something, I feel better. Maybe on a cold winter's day, it's a nice cup of tea, right? You know what, you can tell by looking at me, if I'm hungry, which I am a lot, I can eat something and be satisfied, right? Well, if I'm in a lake and I'm underwater and realize I can't breathe, I go to the surface and I breathe in, and I'm okay again. The Word of God is just as important to our spiritual lives as water, as food, and as air. We can go without those things for a while, can't we? For a while. You can go without water or liquid. You can go without food for a little bit longer. You can go without air for a lot less. But we can go without them for a while. I mean, some of you may have been those kids when you're in elementary school to see how long you can hold your breath without breathing, right? And you start turning blue and then you give up. We can do it for a while, but we can't do it forever. We need to realize that the Word of God, the Bible, is like that for our spiritual lives. We can go without it for a while, go spiritually thirsty, go spiritually hungry, go spiritually holding our breath just to see if we can, but we need the Word of God in our lives to grow us spiritually, to sustain us. Matthew 4.4 4 says this, Man being all-inclusive, men and women everywhere, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Remember Jesus when the disciples are talking to him and they haven't eaten for a while and uh, Jesus is talking about food and they're asking him, hey, you know, Master, Rabbi, have you eaten? And he says, I have food that is not of this world. This is what he was talking about. The word of his Father speaking directly to him. And this is what he says again, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And where do we find every word of God? In the Bible, as God speaks to us. The Bible is that, that liquid, that water, that food, that oxygen that revives us and keeps us alive and makes us stronger and fills us and satisfies us when we take it for what it is, the word of God. We read this earlier uh, in Hebrews 4, 12 to 13. For the word of God, now catch this, we're talking about the Bible when we say the word of God, 
You want to be a non-believer and say, well, what is the Word of God? What is the Bible? Well, we answer it right here. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirits, the joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him who must, who must we give an account to. In other words, this word of God is life-changing and it's active, it's current, because God is not dead, God is alive, right? And so is his word. And it speaks to us where we're at. In fact, it goes on, this is why some people don't read the Bible, because it says nothing is what? Hidden from God. You can hide it from your partner. You can hide it from the people at work. You can hide it from yourself. You can even try and deny yourself, but it's not hidden from God. He sees all and speaks to all. So we realize this about the Word of God. Five things that it impacts us in our life. Number one, when we take in the Word of God for what it is and He's at work in us, it pulls us from our messy world, which I don't know about you, but most of our world's pretty messy, right? It pulls us from our messy world into God's world and helps us to know God on His term. And this changes our world and life view. If we see things, as most people do, within the realms of our control or lack of control, and we hear the news and all that's going on and all the campaign videos, our world is just a mess. But when we take in the Word of God, we see the world through God's eyes, and that is a radically different view, isn't it? For instance, as we've talked about before, he says that our life is really but a vapor. It's temporary. It's a short-term practice for a long-term eternity. We're just practicing now. Isn't that cool? In essence, we kind of get a do-over once we die, right? We get to go on to eternal life and make sure we're doing it right in God's kingdom. So it pulls us from our messy world into God's world and helps us to know God and to see things through his eyes. Number two, it renews our mind and it acts as an anchor in our lives when the waves of this world are crashing around us. It renews our mind. The Bible says that through the Holy Spirit and through salvation, we have the mind of who? Of Christ. We literally have the mind of Christ. We see things again differently. It renews our mind with all that crud that's been put in there. It can clean it up. It can straighten it out. It can get all that bad stuff out. And the Word of God will be taken into our lives and allow it to fill us and make us content in God. It acts as that anchor. That I don't know about you, but my world a lot of times is in a crazy mess and all around me, right? Circumstance, situation. But the Word of God holds true in that God is with me, God is for me, God is the lifter of my head, God is my strength and my salvation, God is my hope and my future, God is my all in all. And I can rejoice in trials because of Him, I can be content because of Him, that when my world around me is spinning and those waves of life are crashing, as I take in that Word of God, it's that anchor that makes it okay. You think about that image. This one's for Richard because he likes boats, boats on the beach. If you're out there on the seas and you put that anchor down and the storm's on, you're going to be shaking around a little bit, but you're not going to be taken out of control, are you? You're anchored until safety comes, until the storm calms. And that's what the Bible does. Number three, the Bible gives us clarity on decisions in life. Anybody ever have those guilt complexes like you go to the store and you buy something and then the next day you feel guilty for buying that? <laughs> you buy something off eBay and Amazon and then it's in the mail, it shows up, and you're like, oh, why did I get that? I don't need that. I've got 15 of them already, right? That shopper's guilt, well, we have that in life too. I've done, uh, with Cisco, when I was training, I did multiple um, personality testings, not because I have multiple personalities, but multiple... <laughs> Just so you know, multiple psychological um, testings. And this is one thing 
it says about my personality and the makeup of, of my mind, which is actually really messed up. So it says that I'm good at making decisive decisions when I need to, which is good, right? But then I have guilt and anxiety about them a day later thinking, oh my gosh, did I make the right decision and I'm stressed out. Anybody else ever do that? Ken's like, no, dude, you're just weird. <laughs> the Bible gives us clarity in life because it has those negative commands. It says, do not do this. But what those negative commands, there's always two positives, to protect us and to provide us. When it says, do not lie, it's protecting us that we don't have to keep making lies to make, cover our first lie. Plus, it protects us in that we don't have to apologize for anything, right? Every negative command has two positives. It protects us and provides us. And then the positive commands keep us in line with God. So when we take in the word of God and we understand it, we know that God is speaking to us saying, hey, I'm going to take care of you. And in your messy world, here's the path you need to go on. In fact, Jesus says it's what kind of path? It's a narrow path, right? It's a narrow path. But it's the path of salvation. So, and it leads to life. That wide path leads where? Death and destruction. The narrow path of Jesus leads to life. So what it does in giving us clarity in our decisions in life, when I'm in there and, you know, I'm in that bakery and someone just happens to leave a giant cupcake on the counter and they're looking the other way, and my mind is saying, oh, I'm hungry and that cupcake looks so good. They're not even looking and there's no security cameras around. Come on, you do that too. Don't you look to see if there's security cameras in places? I know you do, right? There's no security cameras around. I could just take that and hide it under my coat and walk out. No, the Bible gives me clarity because he calls, what does God call that? Stealing. Stealing. Back then, making that little cupcake an idol, right? Yeah. It's stealing. So God says, John, don't do that. You're tempted by it. But you don't have to buy in the temptation, so it gives me clarity in life. Now, that's a stupid little example, but it gives us direction, doesn't it? The Bible speaks to us in relationships, in finances, in social life, in personal life. It speaks to all those aspects of our life. How we are to work. If you're in a management position, not to take advantage of the workers. The Bible speaks to all of that about how to live life. And he protects us. And he provides for us. That's what the Bible does. Fourth, in essence, through the Holy Spirit, the Bible cleanses us. Do you know why the Bible cleanses us? Because it confronts the sin in our life. You ever not want to read the Bible because you know that passage of Scripture you're coming up to is speaking to the issue that you are doing and you don't feel guilty about it and you don't feel bad and you want to keep doing it, but you know when you look at that verse in the Bible, that chapter, it's going to hit you right between the eyes, so you just skip that chapter. Look the wind, blew that over, right? The Bible confronts the sin in our life. Why? Because God wants us to suffer, right? No. God confronts that sin in our life because he wants to take that from us and replace it with something worthwhile, something satisfying and good and long-lasting, something that's genuine and authentic, that's real, that's useful. So it confronts that sin, and God says, yeah, I know you're doing this, because <laughs> we already read there is nothing hidden from God, right? So as God sees us, he speaks to us, and he wants to work in our lives, he says, I want to make you better. I'm not here to hurt you, to wound you, to make you feel bad, to make you feel guilty. In fact, I came to relieve that from you. But we got a little work, a little cleanup to do, right? I never like cleaning things up at home, but I sure like the result when it's done, right? We have to go through that cleanup process sometimes. We love the result. The process is a little hard, but God calls us to go through that process. And then a beautiful thing about God calling us to go through that cleanup process is this. We realize we hate that so much that we don't want to go back there again, right? We learn something through it, and God moves in us. So the Bible cleanses us by confronting sin in our life, and it calls us to get rid of that sin, and then to replace it with something authentic and genuine and satisfying. And finally, 
as we allow the Word of God to, to move and change in our lives, the fifth thing that it does is this. It gives us fuel for life. Transforming power. We read of the Bible having uh, dunamos power. The dunamos is the Greek word. If you've been here at church for a while, we know what dunamos means, or what word comes from the word Greek word dunamos. It's what? Dynamite. Dynamite. Explosive power. That if we allow the Word of God to take root in our lives and saturate us in our mind, it gives us strength and transforming power to press on, not to be overwhelmed or overtaken. To be able to move through life and be okay. I mean, you think of Paul. We, always, we often put Paul on a pedestal that he was one of the most godly men. But what did his life really entail to get there? He was beaten, shipwrecked. He was often in prison for preaching the gospel. I mean, the guy's life for Christ was actually quite a bit of mess. Why? Why would a man continue to preach the gospel if that's the reaction you get? Because Paul knew the overwhelming, transforming power of God himself. And Paul said, all that I have, good and bad, is nothing compared to the knowledge and the goodness of God. Man, if we could catch on to that as Christians, that transforming power would radically change our lives. Stephen is being stoned by the religious authorities. And the Bible says he, he looked up and it, his presence just shined and radiated and he went to heaven immediately. He didn't get vicious and attack those who were attacking him, he just gave up his spirit. He was joined with the Lord. Jesus on the cross, beaten, crucified, in prison, betrayed, sold out, and now being killed, looks down and says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Man, if we could allow the Bible to have that life-transforming power in our lives, what could it do in our lives? As ordinary people, what could it do? Well, here's what I think it would do. No matter what you face, it wouldn't conquer you. No matter what you came up against, it wouldn't overtake you. No matter how bad things get, you and I would still be rejoicing. Well, wouldn't that be cool? You can't buy that in a five and dime. You can't get it at Walmart or CVS. You can't even buy it off of Amazon. It's only through the Word of God. That's where we come this morning, how important the Word of God is. We have to accept it and believe it for what it is and then allow it to have that life-transforming change in us. Because, like I said, we're seeking it everywhere else. We're looking for aliens, trying to get to Mars, trying to understand the cosmos, reading National Enquirer, <laughs> we look for it in so many other places when God says it's right here if you'll just pick it up, open it and read it believe it and apply it I'll change your life I'll change your life may we leave this morning with a renewed passion for what God wants to do in us a renewed excitement to seek the Lord with all our heart our mind and our strength not casually, I can take it or leave it, but with all our heart, our mind, and our strength, and allow God's transformation to happen in us, to do that which we cannot do ourselves. Wouldn't that be cool? To be doers of the word, not merely hearers. Let's pray. God, as we seek you, and we want more of you, may you have that life-changing, transforming power in our lives. Lord, as we pick up your word, the Bible, we don't run from it, we don't avoid it, we don't hide from it, but we seek you out through its pages. As we know, it's living and active, and it speaks to us, and it changes us. May we take up your word and allow you to speak to us from your perspective and be grounded and founded in salvation in you. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.